NBC News reports that Republican and Democratic Senate negotiators say they've struck a deal to enact stronger border security laws, including increasing the Border Patrol, and that the text of the bill could be released as early as tomorrow or over the weekend. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he plans to hold the first procedural vote on the legislation no later than Wednesday. The Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, has already said that the Senate bill would be dead on arrival in the House of Representatives without reading a single word of the bill. Speaker Johnson said he conferred with Donald Trump, who does not want the bill to be passed because Donald Trump doesn't want President Biden to get any credit for strengthening border security. Donald Trump is thrilled to be blamed for attempting to kill the bill in the Senate and possibly already having killed the bill in the House of Representatives. They're blaming it on me. I said, that's OK. Please blame it on me. Please. OK, we will. If Donald Trump were to win the presidency, and I don't think he will, he could not possibly sign a new border, border security law until the end of February of next year, at the very earliest. And he could only do that if he had 60 votes in the Senate to pass the bill, which he won't. But let's just assume it. Let's just work with the hypothetical that Donald Trump will sign a border security bill at least as strong as this one 13 months from now. Donald Trump says he wants us to blame him for what happens in the meantime. According to Donald Trump, that means blame him for killing 300,000 people. The drug cartels are waging war on America, and we will destroy those cartels. We have to destroy. You know, it's war. I believe we're losing 300,000. Not, you know, they say 91,000. That's not 91,000. 300,000 people a year, I believe, are lost to drugs pouring into our country. That's worse than a war, okay? That's worse than a war. Okay, so that's Donald Trump saying 300,000 people have to die for me, Donald Trump so that I can beat Joe Biden in the Electoral College. There's more. Each drug dealer kills on average 500 people during his or her lifetime. Drugs are pouring in. The drug cartels are waging war in America, and we will destroy the cartels. You have no choice. That's an army. That's an army. They're trying to destroy our country, and they will destroy our country. We are a nation where fentanyl and other forms of illegal drugs are easier to get than groceries to feed our beautiful families. Okay, well, I, for one, know where to get groceries, and I have no idea how to get fentanyl. I've never seen it. I don't want any. Donald Trump is saying drugs are pouring in, the drug cartels are waging war in America, and we have to let them continue to wage war in America for another 13 months. That would be like President Roosevelt saying we have to let the Japanese military continue to attack the United States for 13 months after Pearl Harbor without us doing a thing about it. That's what Donald Trump wants. And according to Donald Trump, it's not just the drugs. You see millions of people coming into our country and totally unchecked from jails, from mental institutions, terrorists. Terrorists are pouring in unchecked from all over the world. Donald Trump told Republican Speaker of the House Mike Johnson he wants terrorists to come into this country unchecked, as he says, for the next 13 months at least. And Mike Johnson must promise to do absolutely nothing about it. And Mike Johnson, who serves only the perverse desires of Donald Trump, said, yes, sir. The House of Representatives has done something uh, that I had kind of started to think was impossible. Uh, a negotiated bipartisan bill, negotiated by Senate Finance Committee uh, Chairman and the House Ways and Means Chairman, a tax bill that is called the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. It went, it got voted through the Ways and Means Committee, now voted through the full House of Representatives. It's on its way to the Senate, where you will have an opportunity to uh, uh, pass this bill that already has this bipartisan design with, the, with Chairman Wyden of your Finance Committee having negotiated it. Uh, and I have to say, I, I, I'm just amazed that, that it has worked so smoothly, and by the way, so quietly. 
Well, great victory for for families, uh, 550,000. The families of 550,000 children in my state alone will benefit from this, 150,000 African-American children. Uh, small business will benefit. We'll keep R&D work in this country so the intellectual property stays here and the job creation is here. Uh, Senator Wyden gets gets great credit for this. He had worked with the chair of Ways and Means. We've been working on this for a year on how do we bring back the child tax credit because we know the impact it had. I mean, one of the joys of this job, and Lawrence, you know that when you staff that committee, is when you hear individual stories from people when uh, uh, the, the wife of a, of an interest of a, a long distance truck driver or teamster telling me at a town hall in Wayne County uh, how what saving the pension meant to her and her husband. Uh, the stories from kids, families that with the child tax credit, they now can afford or better. They can better afford daycare. They can pay for fees for their daughter's soccer teams or their soccer play, soccer games or their their son's theater at school. All the kinds of things that extra dollars, those extra dollars will mean to families. I mean, that that's what makes this job so worthwhile when you hear stories like that. And I, I've heard them in East Palestine. We're going to save them significant tax dollars because of this bill. If we can get it through the Senate, a small provision that's not small to them is big to them and uh, lots of we're seeing a lot of that this just tax bill is a big big deal uh, we got to get it through the Senate 350 70 to 7 to 70 in the House every House Republican and Democrat in Ohio save one voted for it um, one of the best pieces of news in a long time yeah it really is and by the way please pass along my congratulations to the staff of the Senate Finance Committee who I know had to pull a few all nighters to get hired it, some of them yeah to get yeah. it this far and uh, but uh, it, what's so what's so fascinating about it is it's the kind of uh, I'm going to use the phrase old-fashioned legislating that we thought had disappeared you know good solid bipartisan work at the leadership committee of uh, the leadership level of the two relevant committees of jurisdiction you put the package together moves through the, the ways and means and by the way the constitution as you know requires that all tax bills must originate in the ways and means committee so you and the senate had to wait for that uh, and now right. here it is uh, coming to the senate and it has all sorts of provisions in it that, generally speaking, Republicans aren't enthusiastic about uh, these very particular uh, forms of support through the tax code of, of workers and families. Uh, it also has corporate tax provisions in it, like you said, research and development. But uh, it seems to me that you tried to design the corporate provisions to be job enhancing, job creation pieces of the bill. Yeah, I mean, it's cliche-ish to say when, 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 but this one really is. The the business that will benefit, you talked about manufacturing in my state, and it is coming back. And the businesses that will benefit from this are companies. I was on the phone to a number of them today to talk about strategy. How do we get it through the Senate now that we passed it in the House overwhelmingly? It helps families. It helps East Palestine. So that's why I say when, when, when. And uh, that's that's what's really exciting. And you said it was done quietly. It was uh, Wyden and Jason Smith, whom I've gotten to know a little bit, the chair of the committee in the House. And uh, my only complaint, uh, Lawrence, is you always tell them I'm on the finance committee. You never say to your audience, I, I chair the banking housing committee, which means more housing in this country and keeping Wall Street accountable. But that's your bias because you used to run that committee. So fair enough. Our prayers continue to be with the families of the three American servicemen killed and attacked in the FOB in Jordan. Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Brianna Moffitt, and Specialist Kennedy Sanders. I spoke with each of these families separately, and Jill and I will be tomorrow at Dover Air Force Base to receive the dignified transfer of their bodies. That was the president speaking this morning in Washington. At the Pentagon, the Secretary of Defense said this. It's been a difficult few days for the Department of Defense, and the entire department is united in our outrage and sorrow over the death of three U.S. service members on Sunday in Jordan. We all mourn the loss of three Army Reserve soldiers serving at Tower 22. Sergeant William J. Rivers, age 46, Sergeant Kennedy L. Sanders, age 24, and Sergeant Brianna A. Moffitt, age 23. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families and their loved ones, 
And we know that this grief will never leave them. And we hope that they know that the department's love and support will never leave them either. We're also praying for the other American troops who were wounded. Now, our teammates were killed when a one-way attack drone struck their living quarters. And we continue to gather the facts about this deadly attack. Our fallen soldiers had a vital mission to support Operation Inherent Resolve and to work with our partners to ensure the lasting defeat of ISIS. They risked their lives and lost their lives to keep their fellow Americans safe from global terrorism. The President will not tolerate attacks on American troops, and neither will I. Our teammates were killed by radical militias backed by Iran and operating inside Syria and Iraq. In the aftermath of the vile Hamas terrorist assault on Israel on October 7th, terrorist groups backed by Iran and funded by Iran have tried to create even more turmoil, including the Houthis attacking commercial shipping in the Red Sea. So this is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. We will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region. But we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose, where we choose, and how we choose. That was Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's first day back in the Pentagon press briefing room since he was hospitalized for complications following what was supposed to be an outpatient treatment for prostate cancer. He did something today we did not see in the four years of the Trump administration from anyone in that administration. He apologized. Lloyd Austin said, I did not handle this right. Lloyd Austin said, I take full responsibility. He did not just apologize to President Biden for not alerting the president to his medical condition sooner. He apologized to what he called his teammates at the Pentagon, and he apologized to each and every one of us, the American people. And while he was at it, he delivered an important public health alert, especially to black men who are statistically more susceptible to prostate cancer. The apology was everything that a genuine apology should be. It was personal. Lloyd Austin took us inside his private thoughts that led to his mistake. And he took full responsibility for his mistake and did not just promise to do better. He described exactly what he's already done to make sure that such a mistake can never happen again. There may be no better way to take the measure of a man than the quality of his apology. And I say a man because we men, in my experience anyway, which may be different from yours, tend not to be very good at apologizing. The most perverse extreme of that is, of course, Donald Trump, who has never apologized to anyone in his life for anything. That alone certifies Donald Trump as unfit for any responsibility in any activity. For all of us, especially children growing up in the age of Trump who need a lesson in how to apologize, General Lloyd J. Austin III, now Secretary of Defense Austin, gave us that lesson today while personifying the motto of his alma mater, West Point, duty, honor, country. I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right, and I did not handle this right. I should have told the President about my cancer diagnosis. I should have also told my team and the American public. And I take full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and to the American people. Now, I want to make it very clear that there were no gaps in authorities and no risk to the Department's command and control. At every moment, either I or the Deputy Secretary was in full charge. And we've already put in place some new procedures to make sure that any lapses in notification don't happen. 
In the future, if the Deputy Secretary needs to temporarily assume the, off the duties of my office, she and several White House offices will be immediately notified, including the White House Situation Room. And so will key officials across the Department. And the reason for that assumption of duties will be included in writing. Now, I want you all to know that to know why this happened. I was being treated for prostate cancer. The news shook me, and I know that it shakes so many others, especially in the black community. It was a gut punch. And frankly, my first instinct was to keep it private. I don't think it's news that I'm a pretty private guy. I never like uh, burdening others with my problems. It's just not my way. But I've learned from this experience. So taking this kind of job means losing some of the privacy that most of us expect. The American people have a right to know if their leaders are facing health challenges that might affect their ability to perform their duties, even temporarily. So a wider circle should have been notified, especially the president. Now, let me back up a bit. As you know, on 22nd December, I had a minimally invasive procedure to cure me of my recently diagnosed prostate cancer. And then I hit some bad luck during what is usually a pretty easy recovery. On January 1st, I felt severe leg pain and, and pain in the abdomen and hip. And that evening, an ambulance took me to Walter Reed. The doctors found that I had several issues that needed treatment, including a bladder infection, and abdominal problems. On January 2nd, I was also experiencing fever and chills and shallow breathing. The medical staff decided to transfer me to the critical care unit for several days for, for closer monitoring and better uh, team care by my doctors. And the deputy secretary assumed the functions and duties of my office, which happens when necessary. Her senior staff my senior staff and the joint staff were notified of this through our regular email notification procedures. And I never directed anyone to keep my January hospitalization from the White House. On January 5th, I resumed my functions and duties as secretary from the hospital. I was functioning, functioning well mentally, but not so well physically, and so I stayed at Walter Reed for additional time uh, for additional treatment, including physical therapy, for some lingering issues with my leg. Now, I'm offering all of this as an explanation and not an excuse. I am very proud of what we've achieved at the Department over the past three years, but we fell short on this one. As a rule, I don't talk about conversations with my boss, but I can tell you I've apologized directly to President Biden. And I've told him that I'm deeply sorry for not letting him know immediately that I received a heavy diagnosis and was getting treatment. And he has responded with the grace and warm heart that anyone who knows President Biden would expect. And I'm grateful for his full confidence in me. And finally, I also missed an opportunity to send a message on an important public health issue. And I'd like to fix that right now. I was diagnosed with a highly treatable form of cancer, a pretty common one. One in eight American men will get prostate cancer. One in six black men will get it. And so I'm here with a clear message to other men, especially older men. Get screened. Get your regular checkups. Prostate cancer has a glass jaw. If your doctor can spot it, they can treat it and beat it. And the side effects that I experienced are highly, highly unusual. So you can count on me to set a better example on this issue today and for the rest of my life. 